Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Real Engineering, where we look at movies and TV shows with both surprisingly good and laughably bad depictions of engineering. Today we'll be looking at Christopher Nolan's 2014 science fiction epic, Interstellar. For this episode, I'm joined by my good friend Siddharth, an engineer at Telesat Canada who has kindly agreed to provide some hard calculations regarding the orbital maneuvers and spacecraft designs depicted in this film. Now without any further ado, let's dive right in. Interstellar is set in a near future where a massive solar flare and a series of crop lights have turned much of the Earth into a 1930s style dust bowl. Former NASA test pilot Cooper lives on a corn farm with his son and daughter, struggling to scrape by as he dreams of the stars. One day, he discovers a strange gravitational anomaly in his house that points him towards a nearby NASA facility. There, he learns that NASA is planning a bold mission to save humanity. A wormhole leading to another galaxy has been discovered near Saturn, and a spacecraft, the Endurance, is being prepared to travel through it and find a new planet on which to relocate the Earth's population. Cooper joins the crew and sets off on the years-long mission, made even longer by the intense relativistic time dilation generated by the nearby black hole Gargantua. One by one, the crew is killed off as planet after planet proves uninhabitable, until only Cooper and scientist Dr. Amelia Brand remain. Cooper sacrifices himself so Brand can travel to the last candidate planet and ends up falling into the black hole. But rather than dying, he finds himself in a tesseract, a three-dimensional depiction of space-time constructed by humans in the distant future. Realizing that he is part of a closed time loop, Cooper uses the tesseract to create the gravitational anomaly at his house and communicate with his past self. He also transmits physics data from the inside of the black hole to his daughter so she can solve the grand unified theory of physics and construct giant anti-gravity arcs to transport humanity to their new home planet. His task complete, Cooper is ejected from the Tesseract and reunites with his now elderly daughter just before she passes away. The End Much has been written about the plot of Interstellar, whose script was written in close collaboration with astrophysicist Kip Thorne, and while I hope to cover this topic in a future video, this time around we'll be looking instead at the film's depiction of manned space travel. While it's clear that Christopher Nolan and his production design team went to great lengths to make all the hardware look as realistic as possible, there are a number of sequences in this film that come off as, well, shall we say, dubious to anyone passingly familiar with spacecraft design and operations. At the start of the film, the crew travels to the orbiting Endurance aboard a small lifting body shuttlecraft called a Ranger, which is launched atop what appears to be the first two stages of a Saturn V rocket. Ignoring for the moment that we can actually no longer build the Saturn V as the first stage F-1 rocket engines were essentially hand-tuned and the records of those specific tweaks have since been lost, this setup actually makes a lot of sense. Space planes like the Shuttle or the Hermes are typically not large enough to incorporate useful crew or cargo capacity while simultaneously carrying enough fuel to launch themselves into orbit. They must thus either use external fuel tanks like the Shuttle or be launched atop a separate rocket booster. Indeed, this appears to be the case with the Ranger. Up until the crew reaches Miller's planet, the one with the giant tidal waves, and the craft is suddenly revealed to have full single stage to orbit or SSTO capabilities, taking off vertically and climbing into orbit like a shuttlecraft from Star Trek. While this is technically feasible, a Lockheed's cancelled Venture Star space plane was designed to be a self-contained SSTO craft, such a design requires that a significant proportion of the airframe be devoted to fuel storage. But in the same scene, we are shown that the majority of the Ranger's internal volume is devoted to cargo space, with nary a fuel tank in sight. Seriously, where are the fuel tanks? Oof, somewhere Konstantin Soslovsky is rolling in his grave. Now, this is made all the more confusing by the fact that the planet they're exploring clearly has a greater gravitational pull than the Earth. So the Ranger requires a full Saturn V to launch it back on Earth, but is perfectly capable of ascending into orbit on its own on a planet with higher gravity. Somehow. So Dart, what does the math say? Well, knowing the astronauts are able to walk around the planet's surface without much extra effort, I think we can reasonably assume acceleration due to gravity is no greater than 2 or 3 g's. Let's round up to 3. The interstellar fan wiki says that Miller's planet is approximately Earth-sized. So, applying Newton's equation of universal gravitation, we can solve for planetary mass and end up with a value of 1.794 times 10 to the power 25 kilograms. From this, we can calculate the escape velocity needed to leave the gravitational influence of the planet, which we can calculate as 19.375 kilometers per second, or roughly 
1.73 times that needed to leave Earth. Now, there are a couple of other factors to take into account. One of these is called gravity drag, that is, the need to fight gravity for most of the ascent into orbit, since all of the required escape velocity delta v can't realistically be applied all at once. The other is atmospheric drag, as the spacecraft ascends through the atmosphere. Now, since we don't know the ranger's ascent profile, or the composition of the planet's atmosphere, the best we can do is make an educated guess based on launches here on Earth. The combined gravity and atmospheric drag losses for a typical rocket ranges between 15 and 20% of the escape velocity. But, since the Ranger takes off like a VTOL aircraft, like the Harrier, and probably uses some atmospheric lift to gain altitude, let's round this down to 15%. We can now calculate the total delta V required to escape the gravity well of Miller's planet. Though, let's just uh, back off here a bit. Since this only allows you to hop into the gravity well of Gargantua, I don't really know how much better off this makes you. Anyways, adding the 15% extra, we get a total of 22.3 km per second of required delta V. With an estimate of the Ranger's mass, engine efficiency, and required delta V, we can now use the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation to calculate our fuel burn. The beauty of the rocket equation is that even if we don't know the Ranger's actual takeoff mass, we can still calculate how much of that mass it needs to burn to produce the required delta V. Now we already know our delta V budget, and G0 is just standard Earth gravity, which leaves ISP. This is a measure of propulsion system efficiency. Running through propulsion types real quick, uh, most chemical rockets have an ISP in the range of 300 to 450 seconds, while air-breathing engines like ramjets and turbofans have a significantly higher 1,000 to 10,000 second range. And then we have electric propulsion systems such as ion thrusters, Hall effect thrusters, Vasimir. This goes from 1,500 upwards to 20,000 seconds. Existing electric propulsion doesn't really provide anywhere near enough thrust to lift a spacecraft off the surface of a planet, but since the Interstellar Wiki says that the Ranger uses hybrid plasma engines, where chemical rocket exhaust is ionized and then magnetically accelerated, let's assume a wildly optimistic 1000 second ISP. Crunching the numbers gives us an inert mass fraction of 10.3% of takeoff mass, this means that even with an optimistically efficient ascent engine, the Ranger would have to burn over 90% of its takeoff mass to reach escape velocity. Even if we assume that it's just ascending to orbit, this only comes down to 80%. I mean, come on! All that fuel has to be kept somewhere! Ah yes, the patented Invisitank, the fuel storage of the future. Anyway, by now some of you are probably wondering, if the gravity on Miller's planet is only two to three times the Earth's, how are the crew of the Endurance experiencing time dilation as extreme as one hour on the surface equaling seven years back on Earth? Well, my first thought that it was caused by the gravity well of Gargantua, but it turns out that during the writing of the film, Christopher Nolan asked Kip Thorne if this was possible, and Thorne said no. So in order to account for Nolan's requested time dilation ratio, Thorne assumed that Gargantua was spinning nearly as quickly as is possible for a black hole to spin, and pulling the planets around it at nearly the speed of light. Thus, the time dilation on Miller's planet is not due to general relativity, but rather special relativity, which opens a whole other can of worms. If the planets are orbiting Gargantua at near the speed of light, how is Endurance able to match its orbital velocity in order to land on any of them? Did passing through the wormhole somehow cause them to accelerate? If so, they were only shown to be in the wormhole for a few minutes. Either the acceleration was so massive that none of them could have survived, or it took far longer than shown to pass through. Or maybe the warping of spacetime within the wormhole allowed them to accelerate while not falling out of sync with the Earth, and my brain hurts. Uh, let's move on to something easier to wrap our heads around, shall we? Going back to the Ranger's first launch, another major issue with the film's hardware is the Saturn V's launch pad. NASA appears to be operating out of an old nuclear missile silo, and it is out of this that the Ranger launches. However, large engines like the F-1 put out so much sonic energy that sound waves reflecting off the ground can seriously damage the spacecraft. This presented such a danger to the later space shuttle that its launch pad was fitted with a sound suppression water system that dumped 1.1 million liters of water in 41 seconds onto the pad 
to dampen the sonic energy until the spacecraft cleared the launch tower. While the Saturn V did not require such a system, it still launched from an open-air pad. If one was launched from a closed silo, as depicted in the film, the powerful sound waves reflecting off the walls would likely tear the rocket apart before it ever left the silo. Good thinking, guys. The water planet scene does, however, appear to feature a semi-realistic depiction of a now well-known landing maneuver, the Hover Slam. In order to land as close as possible to their target, astronaut Miller's crash spacecraft, Cooper makes a spiraling descent and waits until the last minute to fire the engines and slow the Ranger to a stop. This is, at first glance, the same maneuver used by the spent stages of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets when they make their dramatic vertical drone ship landings, and is based on some simple physics that reveal that a short powerful burn close to the ground actually uses less fuel than a more gradual burn starting at a higher altitude. However, unlike the Falcon 9, which essentially free falls from space, the Ranger is a powered aircraft capable of generating lift and bleeding off excess speed aerodynamically. Cooper's dramatic, efficient landing is thus rather less impressive than it seems. Yes, the Hover Slam. Often known as a suicide burn, it is a highly efficient way to get a spacecraft or rocket stage back to the ground. Provided, that is, you don't unintentionally, to use a phrase from the space industry, lithobreak in the process. Simply put, the less time you spend burning your engine in a gravity well, the more fuel efficient your landing will be. Ideally, you reach zero velocity just as you reach zero altitude. Unfortunately, such a maneuver is extraordinarily risky, especially for a manned spacecraft, and requires incredibly precise engine control. All said and done, given that the future of humanity is at stake, this landing technique seems like a rather unnecessary risk. Now the mystery of the missing fuel tanks isn't limited to the Rangers. According to the Interstellar Wiki, the 12 modules making up the outer ring of the spacecraft consist of three habitat modules, one hibernation module, four landing pods that can be transferred to a planetary surface using the two attached landing spacecraft, and four engine modules. The propulsion system is described as a hybrid variable impulse chemical slash plasma engine powered by a tokamak fusion reactor. And despite the fact that chemical and plasma engines, as well as fusion reactors, all require fuel to operate, there are still no fuel tanks to be found. Seriously, where are they? And given that the Endurance not only has to travel all the way to Saturn, but also fly around an entire planetary system orbiting a black hole, this presents something of a problem. <laughs> well, that's putting it mildly. Uh, while calculating these types of interplanetary maneuvers is dependent on the engine type and the particulars of the planetary system, we can still estimate the fuel fraction Endurance would have to burn in order to reach Saturn. Now, the Interstellar Wiki says the journey from Earth to Saturn in the film takes 14 months, so let's suppose we plan to launch in the year 2076 and arrive in 2078. We can use the website called Transfer Calculator to get our approximate delta V budget, in this case 40 to 50 kilometers per second. Gravity assist transfers to Saturn currently take up to a decade, so in order to arrive within two years, we would definitely need to use the most efficient engines possible, uh, say with an ISP of around 20,000 seconds. Using our trusty rocket equation, we get an inert mass fraction of 0.774. So 20 to 25% of Endurance's mass would have to be made up of fuel, which once again raises that question, where the heck is it being stored? Also, how does 14 months transit time justify the use of hibernation pods? In the film, the pods are shown being used to ward off the effects of long periods spent in isolation, but between January 1994 and March 1995, Russian cosmonaut Valery Poryakov spent nearly 14 months aboard the Mir space station and was none the worse for it psychologically. And while I suppose it could be argued that hibernation is used to reduce consumption of food, water, and oxygen, the crew are shown to be pretty liberal in their use of resources when jetting around the gargantua system. Surely they could have used those 14 months to refine some of the more questionable aspects of the mission, such as the fact that their plan B consists of a cryostat full of embryos and a single female crew member. Hmm. Finally, we reach the climax of the film. After being damaged by an explosion set off by the insane astronaut Dr. Mann, the Endurance no longer has sufficient fuel or engine power to leave orbit and travel to Edmund's planet, the last on the list. 
Cooper thus proposes using the attached Ranger and Lander spacecraft as boosters. However, drawing on the concept of rocket staging, Cooper realizes that the maneuver won't work unless the Rangers are jettisoned after the burn, and heroically allows himself to be cast off into the black hole along with them. Okay, um, so, a lot of this maneuver actually makes very little sense. For one thing, Endurance's engines appear to fire first, followed by the Rangers and Lander in a staggered sequence. This is similar to how the uh, SRBs on the space shuttle were not lit until after the main engines had reached full throttle. Um, this was only done because once lit, the SRBs, being giant firecrackers, couldn't be shut off. In the case of Endurance, however, where all the engines involved are fully throttle level, this staggered ignition sequence makes little sense, since at least for a few moments, Endurance is just dragging along the dead weight of the Rangers and their fuel without those spacecraft contributing anything to the total thrust. It's not terribly efficient. Then there's the topic of trying to perform a slingshot maneuver around a black hole. Uh, in order to stay outside of the event horizon, Endurance would have to be, um, technical term here, hauling ass, traveling at least a few percent of the speed of light. According to special relativity, courtesy of Einstein, objects traveling at even very low relativistic speeds actually gain mass according to the mass-energy equivalents. Essentially, relative mass approaches infinity as you approach the speed of light. This is exactly why objects with mass can't travel faster than light. You would need uh, infinite energy to accelerate the infinite mass any faster. Building on this, it's a distinct possibility that whatever mass endurance lost from discarding the rangers would just be gained back moments later due to its sheer speed. And that's far from the only problem Cooper and Brand have to deal with. There are massive gravitational fluctuations that close to a black hole and Endurance's crew run the serious risk of the boosters tumbling uncontrollably and impacting Endurance. Plus, extreme tidal forces in the vicinity of the black hole could just shred the whole spacecraft apart. And then again, firing engines that close to the event horizon of a black hole would make for some massive gains in velocity courtesy the Oberth effect, so if overall efficiency was what they were going for, then hey, mission accomplished. Whether or not the risk was worth risking total annihilation or losing 51 years of your life due to time dilation, um, that depends, I suppose, on just how things are going back on Earth. Now, despite the fact that we've spent over 18 minutes ragging on its spacecraft design, Interstellar is still one of our all-time favorites. It's bold, exciting, emotional, inspiring, and downright gorgeous to look at. And despite its various flaws, it's still one of the most accurate science fiction films of its type, weaving in the kind of physics into its plot that we never thought we'd see in any major Hollywood film. If you haven't already seen it, it's definitely worth a watch. Anyway, thank you again to Siddharth for providing his in-depth analysis. I'm Jean Messier, and I'll see you again on another episode of Real Engineering, only on our own devices. Thank you for watching.